Recording in progress. All right. So tonight's tonight's lecture has nothing to do with what I just talked about. Absolutely nothing to do with it, uh, unless the fact that you are um, <laughs> unless there's a mass toxicology issue that uh that happens and you know that I guess that could be a, an event. Uh, so today, chapter twenty three will be toxicology. And that's what we'll be going over. Does anybody want to bring up anything from the past from past week uh, before we get started officially into this? Any anything they want to go over as far as questions or anything like that? Okay. If not. Then we will get to rocking and rolling. All right, National EMS Education Standard Competencies. Oh, I just read, Leanne, I'm sorry. Um, I just saw what you put in there. Uh, as a basic, you're in charge of one of the triage tents before before all the trucks were able to arrive. So don't take it as that, as a basic. On, I'll tell you this right now. Um, uh, being in charge of aircraft incidents, uh, especially like commercial airliner aircraft incidents, a lot of times, our first our first triage was done by basics. You want to take a guess why? Why I would rather have a basic do triage? So I'm actually going to want a I'm actually going to want a basic to do triage first because they're not going to get into the weeds. They're not going to get stuck in la la land trying to field diagnose every patient they come across. Uh, if you use start triage, you're doing RPM, right? So you're looking at you're looking at respirations, pulse, mental status, Refer and next person respirations, pulse, mental to status, so on and so forth. You keep it you keep it on the simple basis, basic life support, because that's what triage is about. Secondary triage. And then treat, you know, treatment and triage is whenever you put, whenever you put the paramedics up there, or what have you, your AEMTs, your paramedics, and the secondary triage that do treatment and triage, and then you have somebody that's in charge doing transport, or you have a knowledgeable basic that can do transport as well. Mm -hmm. um, but as a, as a first, as a first shot, the first people in, um, more than likely on scenes that I was that I was a part of uh, were basics. And uh, that's because, like I said, they're going to get the job done. They're going to get it done quickly. If they're good with their, if they're good with their uh, triage, uh, their triage assessments, man, that rapid tri triage, they're going to knock it out fast. So that's why, that's why I always, uh, I would always choose or pick or assign a basic as a initial level on that. Because I knew they were gonna knock it out, so it's it's not even though I was a basic, and you know you may have got that job because you were a basic. Awesome, that's a good that's a good one though. All right. Yeah, I was. Uh, I've done a few. I've done a few tornado incidents. Uh, did I did a train uh, train derailment? Uh, I've done a couple of bus. I've done some bus incidents. Um, aircraft uh, large-scale aircraft 
small scale aircraft, and then um, also dealt with you know d different hurricanes. I was I was there. I was a basic during Hurricane Katrina, and uh, you know we were doing searches and everything else back then. So yeah, I definitely understand it. It's a uh, it's one of those deals that it's it's pretty rough. It can be rough on you. All right, so introduction. Um, <laughs> AMTs, well, they, they had one derail in uh, Bay St. Louis. Or what, was it Waveland? I think it was Waveland. Years ago. In the middle of the city. So, AMTs treat patients who have taken drugs uh, of abuse almost daily, right? So, due to the nature of the drug or use and abuse, it's almost impossible to identify the number of drug users. Sorry, I lost my light here. Yeah, I did one in New Augusta some years ago. Um, so th these these drugs they they may include illicit drugs, uh, or or I'm sorry, they may include legal drugs or licit, not illicit, but licit drugs, legal drugs, such as alcohol and oxycodone, uh, and it, or they may include drugs uh, that are illegal or illicit. Uh, such as heroin, ecstasy, things like that. A poison is a substance that is toxic by nature, no matter how it gets into the body or in what quantities. Uh, at minimum, it will make a person ill. Okay? At worst, it's going to kill the person. <coughs> A drug is a substance that has some therapeutic effect when given in the appropriate circumstances and dose. Examples of this are going to be reducing inflammation, fighting bacteria, or producing euphoria. Um, whether licit or illicit, when a drug is taken in excess, a person is said to have overdosed. Uh, overdose, overdose is what we would call a, toxic, a toxicologic emergency and then um, also the person the person has been poisoned at the time of an overdose that would be a poisoning so what are the types of toxicologic emergencies well I'll tell you uh, toxicology is a study of toxic or poisonous substances right Toxicology. Uh, toxic, toxicologic emergencies usually fall into one or two of the general headings. Uh, you have intentional, which is poisoning in adults is commonly an intentional thing. Uh, or you have suicide is often accomplished with the use of drugs also. Uh, unintentional, which may occur in many ways, but some are going to uh, include uh, medication dosing errors. Uh, it may be idio... Yeah, idiosyncratic in nature um, and then childhood poisonings are common especially in younger children we saw an influx of children getting into their their parents or grandparents clonopin uh, for a little bit it was pretty bad So, nature is fraught with tox uh, toxicologic perils. Uh, an example would be like your wild mushrooms that you could you could wind up eating and getting jacked up on. The workplace has toxic hazards, uh, often not identified until exposure has occurred. Uh, examples are going to be cancer from PCBs or asbestosis, some things like that. But also in the workplace, uh, some things you can look for for those toxic hazards 
are some of your signages, like your NFPA 704 signs, uh, which are the, the diamonds. Um, you may have that, the multicolored type diamonds. Or you have things like uh, that you could look up the ERG or what every business should have is some sort of has or that has toxic uh, substances, some sort of hazardous communications program uh, or SDS binder that you can you can get a hold of to find out exactly what is, you know, what's the deal with certain uh, toxic or hazardous items that you may have in your place of business or in a place of business. So, unintentional toxicologic emergencies can occur as a result of neglect or oversight. Uh, for example, a person who, that a person with diabetes that takes too much insulin. Yeah. So the risk associated with chemical and biologic warfare have drawn increasing uh, attention lately. So intentional. Intentional poisoning or overdose may occur during more smaller scale crimes. Uh, for example, uh, something called like ropinol. Ropinol is date rape. So date rape drug used to facilitate sexual assault. That would be a, a, a deal with chemical, some sort of chemical criminal. And then you have... Uh, Chloral, chloral hydrate, which are, has anybody ever heard of knockout drops? And it's used to commit assault as well. So pharmacologic agents are also used in some types of, or in, in homicide at times. Yeah, bats. Don't forget about those damn bath salts. Be eating people's faces and stuff. It's it's difficult to keep up with however many uh, street drugs that you may have. Don't hesitate to contact a poison, a poison control center for fast information. Uh, the American Association of Poison Control Centers Poison Helpline is right there on the slide. 1-800-222-1222. Uh, so pretty easy, right? The people at the National Poison Control Center can give a fast rundown of the ingestion uh, is it's toxic? Yeah, yeah. So there's been, uh, Hannah, there's been uh, some people that are jacked up on bath salts that actually, I think there was a guy that ate somebody's baby or started eating somebody's baby. Oh, it was a babysitter. A babysitter uh, tried to cook and eat somebody's baby. Yep. Of course, Florida. You know them Florida people. All that heat and stuff getting to their brain. Yeah. Yep. So, don't hesitate. Any of these resources that you have available, uh, don't hesitate to use these resources when you're confronted with a toxin or a poison uh, that you're unfamiliar with. Make that make the call. That's something to keep in handy. So your call to the Poison Control Center also provides information to the center to help them understand if there are certain types of trends, uh, spotting developing public health problems, and evaluate current treatment protocols for different poisonings. Uh, some mobile medical reference apps, such as Hippocrates, uh, is one that's widely used, and it'll help you assist with pill identification. I know you see them all the time because they don't always carry them in a nice little bottle, or they do, and it may be a, a whole bunch of different pills in there, or not the correct pills. So you can always pop it out, look at it, and uh, take a picture of it even, and be able to match it. So uh, Poison Control also offers an online triage tool and a mobile device app called Web Poison Control. So web poison control and the poison controls all together. Uh, it can be used by, by lay people or healthcare providers. Lay people.
So pathophysiology and routes of absorption. Uh, toxins cannot exert their effects until they enter the human body. So the four primary methods of entry are going to be ingestion, inhalation, injection, and absorption. The combination of the amount of toxin and relative speed at which it's metabolized determine are going to determine its effect and uh, excretion rate. Okay. Right. So something funny about uh, melatonin, something funny to, to know about melatonin, and this goes for anything too. So as you, as you take um, melatonin and the more you use it, the more you utilize it, your body, your body actually uh, produces melatonin, right? So if you start taking melatonin, then your body doesn't see a need to produce the melatonin. So then you become dependent on the melatonin to help you sleep. Uh, that's why you have to cycle on and off of things like that. And it's the same thing with a lot of stuff. Um, one of the easy ones that happens all the time is like Afrin, uh, nose, uh, nasal. What do you call them? Nasal squirt? I forget what it's called. So, uh, so a lot of times they'll use that and they'll use it in excess because now their body doesn't produce the natural... The natural uh, yeah, then the natural mucosal factors that help keep it open. And because you use so much afrin or so much nasal spray, that now you use that on the regular basis. Yeah. Yep. My my little boy, he uh, he grinds his teeth as well. Right. <laughs> I lost my place. Oh. So poisoning uh, by injection, oh, no, I'm sorry, by ingestion, sorry. Uh, most common sources are going to be medications around the home. Household chemicals such as uh, cleaning agents are something that's ingested quite a bit. Um, it, it may produce immediate damage to tissues or effects may be delayed for several hours. <coughs> uh, ingestions of Caustic substances cause damage immediately. Some poisons must be absorbed into the bloodstream before they can uh, produce toxic effects. Some of the indicators that you're going to want to look out for, it, it may be obvious, such as, uh, such as a plant with a partially chewed leaf, uh, like, uh, like the what's the popular Christmas plant that everybody keeps around the house during the holidays. Mm, poinsettias. I was looking for poinsettia. You shouldn't chew holly or mistletoe either. But poinsettias, um, a lot of people put those in their house, big leaves, you know. And so dogs will get into them, and sometimes children will get into them. Those are highly dangerous. Those are highly toxic. Poinsettias are. Mistletoe is also highly toxic, but for other reasons. <laughs> you don't even know that mess, bringing that juju on Christmas. Um... Uh, it may be obvious that, like I was talking about with the with the plants of half chewed or missing berries, uh, some stained fingers, uh, lips or a tongue that's stained, or an empty pill bottle, something like that. Uh, 
So if it's an empty pill bottle from something that's been recently filled, some of the things that we'll do on scene that I'm sure you you all do as well is that you'll show up on scene if you feel like there may have been some sort of overdose or possible overdose, you'll ask for the prescriptions and then you'll look at the date, how many was given, and then you'll count. And I've sat there and poured them out, poured them on a table and counted each individual pill and then did the math to see, you know, how many were taken and were they taken at the, you know, at the right intervals or what have you. So we've seen that. Uh, patients complaining of sudden onset of stomach cramps with or without nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea may have an ingested, an ingestion related problem. Toxins that either by oral, oral route uh, generally take longer to be absorbed by the body, uh, providing a more forgiving time frame for treatment. So little absorption occurs in the stomach. Just there's very little. So substance may stay there for a, a variable period. It can stay there for a while. Absorption also occurs mostly in the small intestine. Most poison management aims to remove or neutralize uh, before it gains access to the intestines where it's absorbed at. So syrup of epicac, and I haven't used that term in a while. It's uh, recommended only in a few situations. Uh, a lot of places don't even carry it anymore, but uh, in which the risk of losing consciousness is clearly low. So, but some some emergency medical services or some EMS agencies, yeah. Uh, may allow AEMTs to use activated charcoal as an alternative treatment. I don't see why not. EMTs can use it. Uh, activated charcoal, it comes as a suspension, right? And it binds to the poison uh, in the stomach, and it carries it out through the system. It carries it out of the system when it binds to it. But more effective and safer than that is going to be the syrup of Epicac. However, its administration carries a risk of severe pulmonary injury if it's uh, aspirated. So the first thing you're going to do is what? Assess those ABCs, right? Always assess those ABCs. Many patients have died as a result of problems with the ABCs uh, that might have been managed relatively easy. So you got to be prepared to give aggressive ventilatory support uh, and CPR to a patient who has ingested an opiate, a sedative, or a barbiturate. You may need to get on, you know, get on that pretty quickly. So, because all of those, uh, all those things, the opiate, sedative, and barbiturates, it it cause they all cause depression of the central nervous system and slow the breathing down, and eventually slow it until it they go into a respiratory arrest. The patient may need, also, you need to make sure that you line up IV support and then give any other treatments that, uh, and then any other treatments, you know, with the IV support, they'll be readily available once you get to the hospital. You'll have a good patent IV line hooked up. Rock and roll. All right, so uh, up next, poisoning by inhalation. So most common sources are going to be like your, your home medications, household chemical products, so on, such and such. Um, poison by inhalation can only occur if poison is present in the surrounding atmosphere. Makes sense, right? As long as the patient is in the toxic environment, he or she will keep inhaling the poison. And so will you if uh, that's where it started from. So make sure that you pull your patient out, get out of that IDLH, that area, that IDLH area, immediate dangerous to life and health. Set up an IDLH at all your scenes. Uh, don't enter into the hazardous environment if uh, you know that if there's a hazard going there. If you happen to suspect one, don't go in it. So you can if. 
if you have a need to get a patient and you're in a hazardous environment where you can't do that snatch and grab or anything like that uh, safely, then you need to call for other resources that have uh, protective, specialized protective equipment. In uh, toxic environment situations, you're likely to encounter more than one patient at an emergency scene if that's the issue. So the inhaled toxins are going to quickly reach the uh, alveoli. Uh, it provides almost instant access to the circulation at that point. So the rapid onset of signs and symptoms are, can occur from that. The window of opportunity for treatment is very limited in that, in that issue. Uh, when you're dealing with an inhalation emergency, the first general management consideration is scene safety, right? So uh, specialty personnel will need access to the patient and the patient may need to be decontaminated after removal from the toxic environment. So be prepared for that. Uh, the patient's clothing should be removed during the process. If not, if it gets trapped in there or any trapped gases can get released, it can expose you or re-expose your patient. So inhaled toxins also produce a wide range of signs and symptoms, um, many of which are unique to the, to the toxin involved. It's very helpful to take containers, bottles, or labels from the toxic substance with you when you transport the patient to the hospital. Often, your patients uh, use inhaled poisons to commit suicide, such as when a person sits inside of a vehicle with the engine running in an enclosed garage. Uh, a recent variation on the use of automobiles for suicide, called chemical suicide, involves people using a tightly sealed vehicle as a type of gas chamber. So some signs that to look out for for chemical suicide are going to be uh, taped or sealed windows, locked doors, uh, posted warning signs, a suicide note, uh, empty chemical containers if you can see in the window, or an unusual odor as you walk up to it. If you suspect any type of self-inflicted poisoning uh, has taken place, contact a hazardous materials uh, team and have them remove the patient. The emergency scene often contains clues about the identity of the toxin. So information from the scene and direction from medical control uh, physician is going, it, it'll drive your treatment plan, right? You must treat for hypoxia immediately if you can, if you can do so. Uh, so administer high concentrations of oxygen because it's already in that circulation in order to combat that, you got to re-engage with oxygen. <clears throat> so also, you're going to make sure that you're going to establish vascular access. And then if you want to know if your oxygen, the oxygen you're giving is perfusing correctly, what are you going to use? What, what tool can you use to make sure that the body is perfusing oxygen uh, efficiently. Pulse ox. Awesome. Correct. Yep, throw on that cap. Why? Throw on that cap. All right, let's do this. Let's take a, since we talked beforehand or anything else, let's take a quick break, 10-minute break, and then we'll jump back into this. Let me see here. <coughs> Start your Labor Day at Tractor Supply. Find great deals on lawn care, grilling, and... All right, we will start it back up. Ten minutes. I'll see y'all then.
All right. We are back. So some of the stuff that uh, <laughs> I, was, I went downstairs originally because I thought I was going to be able to eat my supper. But it's not done yet. It was supposed to be done at 7 o'clock. So now I'm hungry. I'm going to be hangry. Um, now so one of the things that we were talking about down there is you know, all the people that we've seen on the news that have been walking around in this uh, flood water, right? And so, uh, barefoot or walking around in a period without waders on or anything like that, that's that's not good. That's not good for you. <laughs> she can do it to me while I'm awake. I don't care. One way or another, whatever. But, uh, so like, I, you know, I was trying, I was, one of the things was my, one of my family members had posted a video of them walking down their street, their flooded street, barefoot, and their kids are in it barefoot or anything else. And so I messaged them and I was like, I was like, hey, get your silly butt back to the house. I was like, you're not supposed to be walking around that water. I was like, if you walk further down the street, you'll see that a lot of that flood water is coming out of your sewer. It's coming out of your sewer pipes and out of the sewer drainage doofus so I was, so make sure you yeah make sure you wipe your feet off before you go in your house nasty <laughs> they were like oh I didn't know that I thought it was all just rainwater everything floods man your sewer floods the drainage floods it's coming out of people's nasty yards it's coming out of people's nasty grot you don't know where that water's what that water's been through once it hits the ground <laughs> once it hits the ground and starts moving people they gonna walk around these people are gonna walk oh my gosh these people are gonna walk around in this stuff and then gripe about a vaccine So, crazy. <laughs> yep. Where do you think all that drainage water is going to? So the water that came up from the sewage goes into the ground drainage and it ends up in the ocean. People are like, ah, oh, no, that's just rainwater. Hell no, it ain't. That's every pit of water that came from the city streets and yards and sewage that overflowed and everything going straight out to the ocean. Don't give me that mess. It's highly diluted, but does it matter? In the long stretch of things, do you want to get in there and swim around? Heck no. 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 <laughs> Poo water, that's right. <laughs> my, my wife quit bringing my son down there when she found what she calls a, uh, a prophylactic jellyfish. <laughs> that's the way she had, she told him when he said, hey, what's this? And he started walking towards it when he was little. When he was littler, um, she said, Oh my God, don't touch that. It's a jellyfish. <laughs> so we called it a prophylactic jellyfish. Any, anyway, for those that don't know, um, condom. <laughs> it was a condom. <laughs> 
Uh, all right, moving on. Poisoning by injection. Yeah, right. Well, it's because everything hold, is held in also. The barrier islands up there hold everything in. You know? It doesn't get a chance to wash it all clean out. Uh, actually, whenever, whenever we have a big storm, that's the cleanest that it usually is because... It has an opportunity to clean out or to get over that over that hump, uh, over those barrier island areas. After Katrina, it was one of the cleanest areas for a while. Well, no, 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 no. Let me take that back. Not Katrina. There was another storm after that. It was really big, but it was a lot of rain. But it was usually after our larger storms where there's a lot of water movement. That's when it's the cleanest because it had a chance to brush off some of that nasty stuff. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Not not Katrina. I remember the chickens. I remember the the hospital that you know blew right into the uh, ocean right there. Uh, all the needles that that were down there in the sand. I remember that because I, I was down there doing all that uh, working, working. <clears throat> All right. Where are we at? Poisoning by injection. Uh, usually, this is going to be the result of a drug overdose or drug abuse. Uh, for example, things like uh, heroin or cocaine. Uh, signs and symptoms can vary greatly with these. So, frequently, the patient may be able to identify the source greatly simplifying the assessment process, right? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, in general, injected poisons are impossible to dilute or remove. Uh, injected poisons are also quickly absorbed into the body uh, or cause intense local tissue destruction. If you suspect rapid absorption has occurred, then you want to make sure you monitor the airway, provide high flow oxygen, be alert for nausea and vomiting, uh, remove jewelry from areas around the injection site if swelling occurs. Um, prompt transport is going to be essential for this. Uh, take all containers, bottles, labels with the patient to the hospital. And then uh, bites and stings are also, they're going to be considered poisoning by injection as well. Don't forget about that. So bites and stings are also poisoning by injection. All right, up next is going to be poisoning by absorption. Uh, some poisons can gain access to the body through the skin. Uh, poisonings by organophosphates and pesticides are often the most serious uh, type. Many corrosive substances will damage the skin, the mucosal membranes, uh, or eyes, causing chemical burns, uh, telltale rashes, and some lesions. Uh, acids, alkalis, and some petroleum or hi like hydrocarbon products are very destructive. Other substances are absorbed into the bloodstream through the skin and then at that time it has systemic effects. Uh, it's important to distinguish between the contact uh, between contact burns and contact absorption. Some of the signs and symptoms of absorbed uh, poisoning include a history of exposure, liquid or powder on a patient's skin, burns, itching, irritation, skin discoloration, odors typical of the substances. Whew, that sucks. So the first step is to avoid contaminating uh, yourself or others. Remove irritating or corrosive substances 
from the patient as quickly as possible. So brushing them, whatever you got to do. Uh, if you need to get a hazmat team in there to do that, then do so. Cut off all the clothing that's been contaminated with poisons or irritating substances. Never pull clothing over a patient's head. Makes sense, right? Uh, it could it, You could introduce the material into the eyes, nose, or mouth at that point, which would be n no go. No bueno. Uh, you should never flush off a dry powder. Uh, that could activate some sort of chemical reaction from that. You want to be able to brush it off. So dry off thoroughly first, then flush the skin with running water. Uh, then wash the skin with soap and water. If you have a large amount of material uh, has been spilled on the patient, flooding the affected part of the uh, of the body for at least 20 minutes, it, that may be the most effective treatment. Flooding it, copious amounts of water, right? Uh, to avoid content, so I'm sorry, uh, if the patient has a chemical agent in their eye, you're going to irrigate the eyes quickly and thoroughly. Uh, to avoid contaminating the other eye, you want to make sure that fluids run from the bridge of the nose outward. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? I, I hadn't seen that in a long time. That's pretty cool seeing that. It worked. It worked. Uh, but you're going to start the process on scene and continue it through transport. So you're going to be doing this for a while. So many chemical burns occur <coughs> in the industrial settings. Uh, trained people will usually be there to assist you, like ERT people. So see the, so Leanne, see the picture there? And see what that is? You. Yeah, I hadn't seen that in a while. It's good stuff, though. Um, don't try to neutralize the substance. Uh, with other chemicals, this may cause more harm, right? Instead, you're going to brush off as much as possible if the material is, is a solid, and then immediately wash off the substance with plenty of water. Um, to obtain, so what you want to do is you want to obtain that SDS. Is what it, it used to be called an MSDS, uh, material safety data sheet now they're just called sds's safety data sheet and transport them with the patient if it, you're at a company and a chemical happens to get in somebody's face eye scan or what have you they should by law have an sds set up or by regulation law yep Beverly. So the only time you should not irrigate the contact area with water is when the patient's been contaminated with a poison that reacts violently with water. Uh, some su substances ignite when they contact water, like some of your potassiums. Um, brush the chemical off and apply dry dressing to that burned area at that point. So you're always going to provide prompt transport to ED or ER or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in route, you're going to continue irrigation and provide oxygen if it's possible. So understanding and using toxidromes. There is a daunting number of substances of abuse. Uh, however, many result in similar signs and symptoms. For example, all narcotics, whether natural or synthetic, work in a similar manner. Ooh. 
So Toxidrome, which is Toxic Syndrome, is all it's saying. Uh, syndrome is like symptoms of poisonous agent. Uh, it's useful useful for remembering the elements in, in managing different substances that fall under the same chemical umbrella. Um, major toxic syndromes or toxic dromes are produced by stimulants, narcotics, uh, sim uh, s sorry, sympathomimetics, and uh, sedatives and hypnotics, cholinergics and anticholinergics. For a list of toxidromes, you can look in your book, uh, Table 23-1 in the text. Uh, table 23-2, it's going to list common signs and symptoms of poisoning. Uh, by reviewing your history and physical exam findings in conjunction with vital signs, you can often develop and work a, diag a working diagnosis to provide appropriate pre-hospital care to that patient. Yeah, I remember it. We were picking up several a day. That's when I first started working with uh, AMR as a paramedic. And that's where I quickly learned. was like, I don't want to do all this. Uh, I don't want to have to do all this documentation. <laughs> so I just stayed being a fire medic. All right, so an overview of substance abuse. It's an area of medicine dealing with drugs of abuse is highly challenging, right? Because there's so much. Uh, uncertainty, about, uncertainty about the prevalence of the problem is an issue. And then continual evolution of the substances is also an issue too. Uh, substance abuse is broadly defined as the self-administration of licit or illicit substances in a manner that is not in accord with the approved medical or social practice. Uh, there is great cultural variation in what is considered substance abuse. So society's definition may have little relation to the potential harm of a substance. Tobacco, for example, is not restricted but causes cardiovascular and respiratory disease. Uh, Marijuana, marijuana use may result in fines or prison. So we can talk about the abuse of it. So here's some basic terms. So drug abuse is any use of drugs that cause physical, psychological, economic, legal, or social harm to the user, user or to others affected by the drug user's behavior. Uh, habituation is the psychological dependence on a drug. Physical dependence is is a psychologic state of adaptation to a drug. It's usually characterized by tolerance to the drug's effects and withdrawal syndrome if the drug is stopped, uh, especially if it's stopped abruptly. Psychological dependence is the emotional state of craving a drug to maintain a feeling of well-being. Tolerance is the physiologic adaptation to the effects whoop, I messed me up um, is the physiologic adaptation to the effects of a drug such that increasingly larger dosage of, of the drug are required to achieve the same effect withdrawal syndrome is a predictable set of signs and symptoms usually involving an altered CNS, uh, central nervous system activity, 
that occurs after the abrupt cessation of a drug or after rapidly decreasing the usual dosage of a drug. All right. Next we have drug addiction, which is a chronic disorder characterized by the compulsive use of a drug substance or of a substance resulting in physical, psychological, or social harm to the user. Uh, user. And then this person is going to continue to use the substance despite the harm. Antagonist. It's something that counteracts the action of something else. In relation to drugs, a drug that is an antagonist has an affinity for a cell receptor. By binding to the receptor, the antagonist prevents the cell from responding. You have potentiation. So in potentiation, enhancement of the effect of one drug by another drug. There'll be an enhancement of effect. Synergism is the action of two substances, such as drugs, in which the total effect is greater than the sum of the independent effects of the two substances. Uh, that's like, for example, if you were to say 2 plus 2 equals 5. So drug abuse occurs in all age groups and social levels. Uh, adolescents are particularly prone to experimentation. That's right. Unless you're talking about synergism. Then 2 plus 2 does equal 5. <laughs> uh, your patient assessment. So... Generally, toxicologic emergencies are medical, but some may also lead to trauma. Uh, your scene size up for a toxicologic emergency are going to be a well-trained dispatcher. It is going to be a great value to determine important information that's going to help you determine proper protection to ensure for your safety, right? A well-trained dispatcher. Depending on where you live, that may be hard to come by. Um, if this information is not obtained before your arrival, you must assess the scene thoroughly to ensure your own safety. <laughs> so, you're going to have to determine the nature and illness. Uh, you got to determine the nature of the illness or mechanism of injury. Number of patients involved the need for additional resources, whether spinal immobilization is going to be required, where the appropriate protective equipment uh, or PPE to avoid being contaminated, uh, patients who have, who have taken an overdose may be extremely dangerous, right? So also you may want to call for law enforcement backup if it's necessary. Ooh, look at that place. As you as you approach the scene, uh, look for clues like you see here in this slide uh, that might indicate the substance or poison involved. Uh, are there any medication bottles lying around the patient in the scene? If so, uh, is there medication missing that may indicate an overdose? Yeah. Um... Are there alcoholic beverage containers present? Are there syringes or other drug paraphernalia on scene? Uh, is there an unpleasant or odd odor in the room? If so, is the scene safe at that point? If there's a suspicious odor or a drug paraphernalia present that may indicate the presence of a drug laboratory, look for that. 
Uh, keep a constant observant eye on the surroundings and keep an open mind when questioning patients and bystanders. Avoid, avoid coming to mistaken conclusions as well. Uh, also, avoid touching and feeling and moving stuff around because you may end up having a meth lab blow up on you. Moving magazines, certain items around, maybe a trigger. So the primary survey begins with your general impression, right? Yep. So the primary survey begins with your general impression. Uh, don't be fooled into thinking that a responsive alert and oriented patient is, a, is in stable condition. Uh, the patient may have a harmful or even lethal amount of poison in their system that's just not had enough time to produce a, a systemic reaction as of yet. You're gonna identify any life threats. You're gonna assess the airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure, A, B, C, D, E's, right? Um, the primary survey is also, uh, may also identify the mechanism of injury or, or nature of illness, may identify it. Uh, a primary survey that reveals a patient with signs of distress or altered mental status gives you early confirmation that the poisonous substance is causing a systemic reaction at that point. So you're going to quickly ensure that the patient has an open airway and adequate ventilation. Uh, don't hesitate to begin oxygen therapy if need be. Uh, consider inserting an airway adjunct to ensure the airway remains open if you can do so. I wouldn't recommend forcing it on a conscious patient. Uh, always make sure if you're working on an airway to have what available? What do you need to have available if you're going to be putting anything down a throat? Very important. Not just oxygen. Suction. That's right. So make sure you got that suction available. Uh, you may have to assist the patient's ventilations with a bag valve mask if, uh, if it needs be. Um, consider the potential for spinal injury in any event, depending on how that person went down. Spinal precautions in an unresponsive patient mm -hmm. must begin with the airway. Uh, it must begin when the airway is first opened and continue if positive pressure ventilations are needed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, use diagnostic tools such as a pulse ox, it's always good, or capnography. Uh, the reading may be inaccurate if the patient has been exposed to carbon monoxide. Always treat the patient and not the diagnostic tool. We've talked about that on several occasions. Never withhold oxygen based on a pulse ox reading. So if it looks like they're in distress, take it as that. Treatment for CO poison is going to consist of high flow oxygen and transport to a hyperbaric chamber. Do you know where the hyperbaric chambers are, uh, are close by? in your jurisdiction or what your closest hyperbaric chambers are. So that's something to look up. Especially after storms and you know things of this nature, a lot of CO poisoning because of why? Yep, there's a couple down here on the coast as well. So up next, you're going to assess the patient's circulatory status. So ass assess the pulse and skin condition. Uh, stimulant exposure may result in restless, 
restlessness, agitation, or incessant talking, uh, insomnia, anorexia, dilated pupils, tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, hypertension or hypotension, paranoia, seizures, or it could go all the way up to cardiac arrest. Uh, de depressant exposure generally presents with respiratory depression, bradycardia, drowsiness, and possibly a coma. You'll find variations depending on the substance that's involved, variations of that. Always check for bleeding. Uh, obvious alter, uh, alterations in ABCs or poor general impression are indicators for immediate transport, right? So a delay on the scene to further assess and treat the patient is rarely indicated in these aspects. Some industrial settings have decontamination stations and antidotes available on the site, so you may want to utilize those. Uh, and, and in those cases, uh, decon and antidote administration will most likely have been initiated before your arrival and should not delay transport. So consider decon of the patient before transport, depending on the poison to the patient that was exposed to also. Uh, Decon is especially important if you're transporting by helicopter. So up next, your history taking. After completing the primary survey, you gotta uh, you gotta begin obtaining the history. So m many poisoning and overdose cases involve patients with medical conditions. Uh, in these cases, you're going to elaborate on the chief complaint using what? OPQRST, right? If your patient is responsive, begin an evaluation of the exposure uh, and the sample history, which can be done in route, by the way, also. If the patient is not responsive, attempt, attempt to obtain the history from another source if you can, like friends, family, uh, medical identification jewelry, cards in a wallet, anything like that. Your sample history, so is next. Um, three assessments should give you direction in the interventions your patient may need. Uh, the sample history guides you and what to focus on as you continue to assess the patient's complaints. The physical examination helps to determine the visible signs of a reaction to the toxin. Uh, vital signs may indicate any psychological, or I'm sorry, any physiologic uh, response to the exposure, as well as give you an, an indication of the urgency. To choose the appropriate course of action in a toxicologic emergency, obtain at least the following uh, specific information, right? What is the agent? If you know the subs if you know the substance involved, you'll it, you'll be better to you'll be better able to assess the appropriate resources and determine the lethal doses before harmful effects uh, begin. Effects of the substance of toxic levels and appropriate interventions also. You're going to be able to know that. When was the poison ingestion, injection, absorbed, or inhaled? So when was the poison ingested, injected, absorbed, or inhaled? So this is going to let you know if, uh, if and when the harmful effects will begin or how long ago harmful effects began. Um, this is going to affect your treatment decision for emergency physician. And then also uh, acute onset events often indicate a more, more serious patient scenario. <clears throat> Up next, you got <coughs> how much was taken. So the poison center will be able to inform you whether the patient has had a harmful or lethal dose. Of that when you call them and you tell them after they tell you how much they've taken um, there's almost always a correlation between dose and toxic effects 
You also need to possibly ask what else was taken. A majority of intentional self-poisonings or illicit drug overdoses involve a poly drug ing ingestion. So this information will help the emergency department staff decide which test to order. Next question is going to be over what period did the patient take the substances? Uh, has the patient or bystander performed any interventions? Has the intervention helped? So interventions performed before your arrival may cause more complications and affect future interventions. That's why you need to know that. <clears throat> has the patient vomited or aspirated? If so, how soon after exposure and how much? How much does the patient weigh? Antidote dose is usually based on a uh, patient's weight. That's why. Why was the substance taken? Uh, you may not get a reliable answer, but it's okay to ask anyway, right? It could be an indicator of abuse or a suicide attempt even. So put the reason in quotation marks on your PCR. If the patient has overdosed on a prescription drug, uh, take the pill bottle and the remaining pills to the uh, EDB uh, with the patient. If the if the substance has a it was a commercial product, uh, take the take the container and its remaining contents to the ED. If the patient ingested a plant, uh, ingested a plant, find out what part. And take a sample of the plan, if you can, to the ED. If the patient vomits, give a sample of the vomitus in a clean, closed container. Such as an emesis bag. <clears throat> yep, that's right. So your secondary assessment, it's going to focus on an area of the body. Uh, it's going to focus on the area of the body involved with the poisoning or the route of exposure. Uh, the specific focus of your physical exam is largely based on the route of exposure of the uh, and drug or the chemical involved. Take the time to learn about the effects of general classes and drugs of chemicals. So the general classes of drugs and chemicals. Once the life threats have been addressed and managed in primary assessment, uh, conducting a thorough physical will provide additional information on the exposure itself. A general view of all body systems may help to identify systemic problems to come. Uh, a complete set of baseline vitals must be performed in, in these instances. Many poisons produce no outward indications of seriousness of the exposure. Uh, alterations in the level of consciousness, pulse, respirations, blood pressure, and skin are the most sensitive indicators that something serious is wrong. And then keep in mind that CO, that carbon, carbon monoxide, may produce false pulse oxy oximetry uh, readings. They'll be really high. So reassessment. The condition of the patient exposed to poison may change suddenly and without warning, right? So continually assess the patient uh, for adequacy for adequacy of the ABCDEs. Um, repeat the assessment of vital signs and compare it with the baseline set. And then evaluate the effectiveness of your interventions that you provided. Repeat these assessment of vital signs. Remember five minutes or more often for a patient who has consumed a harmful or lethal dose every 15 minutes for a stable patient. So interventions. Treatment depends on what the patient was exposed to, how uh, he or she was exposed, and other signs and symptoms found in your assessment as well. 
Supporting the ABCs is going to be your most important task. Uh, dilute airborne exposures with oxygen, if you can. Uh, remove contact exposures with copious amounts of water unless it's contraindicated. Consider also activated charcoal uh, for ingested poisons. Uh, these patients may vomit at any time, so continuously monitor their airway. Uh, and then contact med control or a poison center to uh, discuss treatment options as well. Once you've completed your primary survey, history taken, or and your secondary assessment, contact med control to request necessary interventions. Report as much information as you have about the poison or chemical to the hospital before arrival. If a, sa if a safety data sheet is immediately available in a work setting, uh, take it with you to the hospital. If this document is not immediately available, ask the company to send it uh, via email or fax to the receiving hospital. You can sometimes Google an SDS on certain chemicals too if you can get the name. All right, so emergency medical care. You're gonna ensure scene safety, follow standard precautions, perform an external decontamination, you're gonna remove, gonna remove tablets or fragments from the patient's mouth if you can. Uh, wash or brush the poison from the patient's skin also if need be. Assess and maintain your ABCs. Provide oxygen and perform assisted ventilations if it's necessary. Uh, if the patient dis demonstrates signs and symptoms of shock. Provide treatment according to the local protocol. If approved by med control, give activated charcoal. It'd be good for them. They may not think so, but it is. So, activated charcoal is not indicated for patients who have ingested an acid, an alkali, or a petroleum product. Also, who have decreased level of consciousness and can't protect their own airway or who, who are unable to swallow. Those are contraindications of uh, activated charcoal. Activated charcoal, it absorbs or sticks to many commonly ingested poisons, uh, preventing the poison uh, or preventing the toxin or the poison from being absorbed into the body by the stomach or the intestines. You will likely carry plastic bottles of pre-mixed suspension. Uh, each is going to contain up to 50 grams of activated charcoal. Some common trade names are going to be like Instachar, Actidose, and uh, Liquichar. The usual dose is one gram of activated charcoal per kilogram of body weight, which translates into... 25 to 50 grams for adults, 12.5 to 25 grams for children. The administration of activated charcoal uh, carries with it severe risk of aspiration, so be mindful of that. So never give activated charcoal to someone who can't protect their own airway. And then always check with med control uh, or poison control before you administer it as well. The major side effect of ingesting activated charcoal is black stools, better than death. Uh, if the patient has ingested a poison that causes nausea, he or she may vomit after taking activated charcoal as well. Uh, the, dose will, uh, the dose will have to be repeated at that point. And uh, be prepared for vomiting, nausea, nausea, and possible airway problems also if that happens.
All right, so pathophysiology, assessment and management of specific poisons, such as like alcohol here. Um, most widely abused drug in the United States. Go figure. 15 million people in the United States, which more than 10% of the population suffer from alcoholism. Uh, alcoholism is a state of physical and psychological addiction. Fourth leading cause of death in the United States is alcoholism. Uh, people with alcoholism tend to have chronic malnutrition and fall frequently, increasing the likelihood of trauma, right? Uh, alcohol is a powerful central nervous system depressant. It's a sedative. Uh, which is a substance that decreases activity and excitement. It's also a hypnotic, which induces sleep. Uh, alcohol dulls the senses of awareness, allows or slows, <laughs> slows reflexes, and reduces reaction time. It also causes aggressive and inappropriate behavior and lack of coordination. In case you didn't know or have ever known anybody to drink or drink yourself. So a person who appears to be intoxicated may have other problems as well. Uh, you're going to look for signs of head trauma, toxic reactions, uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, severe alcohol ingestion may cause hypoglycemia, uh, which may contribute to symptoms. Assume that all intoxicated persons are experiencing a drug overdose and require a thorough examination by a physician. Uh, severe alcohol intoxication is a form of poisoning as well. So it carries some lethal potential as any other CNS depressant may. Death from, uh, death from respiratory depression or aspiration of vomitus or stomach contents secondary to a suppressed gag reflex is the most immediate danger that you'll have to an, acute, uh, to an acutely intoxicated person. Physical dependence on alcohol results from the regular consumption of large quantities of alcohol. Uh, this becomes apparent when a person abruptly stops consuming. Yes, it is. But what's that done in conjunction with? What are we? What are we trying to? Uh, what are we trying to deal with if we're using thymine? That's right, D50 for diabetic patients, right? So a person with alcoholism is considerably more prone than a sober person to a number of illness and injuries. Uh, liver damage is the most common. Up to 90% of heavy drinkers have some level of hepatitis uh, uh, and 10 to 20% of alcoholics will develop cirrhosis. So you also have an increased incidence of pancreatitis. Uh, development of erosive gastritis may, call, may occur. Increased risk of breast and uh, colorectal cancers can occur. Long-term abuse of alcohol leads to atrophy of the cerebrium. Um, and uh, result, that's going to result in permanently reduced mental function as well. So if an intoxicated patient is unresponsive, you're going to treat as you would any other unresponsive patient. You're going to establish and maintain an airway. Uh, with an intact gag reflex, you're going to place the patient in the left lateral recumbent position with suction ready uh, if the patient may vomit. If there's no gag reflex, you're going to place an appropriate airway and ventilate the patient with a bag valve mask, right? So consider calling for paramedic backup for intubation and cardiac monitoring. Uh, administer high concentration of supplemental oxygen and assist with ventilations as needed. Uh, you're going to also you're going to establish vascular access. 
So the patient's blood glucose and treat hypoglycemia if it's found. Uh, and transport the patient to an appropriate facility. So internal bleeding could be suspected if the patient appears to be in shock or hypoperfusion because blood might not clot effectively in a patient who has prolonged history of alcohol abuse. Uh, a person who has been drinking heavily for an extended period, uh, period and then stops suddenly may have a variety of withdrawal symptoms. So some of that seizures can usually occur within 12 to 48 hours of that sudden stop. Uh, use the same plan described for alcohol intoxication. Call for paramedic backup to give uh, benzodiazepines for seizure controls. <clears throat> Treatment for patients in DTs is aimed at protecting the patient from injury and supporting the cardiovascular system. Uh, terrifying hallucinations can create combative, uh, combativeness in a patient. Try to keep that patient calm if you can. Administer oxygen by a nasal cannula uh, to kind of keep them calm. Establish your vascular access if you can. Uh, manage hypotension with an infusion of normal saline and reassess breath sounds constantly. Uh, you're also gonna maintain a dialogue with the patient to help orient, reinsure, or to reassure that patient that everything's gonna be okay. All right, let's take a uh, 10 minute break. And then we'll hit back at it.
right. Cool. All right, and we're back. So uh, we're talking about narcotics, opiates, and opioids now. So a narcotic, uh, a narcotic is a drug that produces sleep or an altered mental status. Uh, it's, it's classified. Give him a minute, guys. I'll probably be back in a second.
Um, we're still having a little bit of uh, issues up here with uh, weather and what have you. So I don't know if that's what knocked out my internet. I got it hooked into my Wi-Fi now, or to my little Wi-Fi device. That's what I bought it for. It should still be, yeah. I had to unplug my mic to so I to use the uh, USB for my Wi-Fi. All right. <clears throat> so where are we at? Uh, narcotics, narcotics, opiates, and opioids. Um, talked about narcotic abuse is one of the most common causes uh, causes of overdose deaths reported to poison centers. Uh, narcotic narcotics agents are gonna include things like your, um, your morphine, codeine, heroin, fentanyl, uh, isocodone, um, your uh, meperidine, um, or meperidine, however you wanna say it. Um, there's uh, quite a few more. So these drugs are gonna exhibit highly diverse effects and very widely in potency. Uh, opioids are usually primarily in clinical medicine or analgesia. Uh, heroin is abused for the unique euphoria it produces. Uh, fentanyl and its derivatives are also potent that can, be, uh, that can present a danger to you and other providers if you're exposed while carrying, caring for the patient. <clears throat> uh, opioids produce their major effects on the central nervous system by binding with receptor sites in the brain and uh, other tissues. Opioids are readily absorbed through the GI tract, but can also be absorbed through the nasal mucosa uh, or snorted and uh, from the lungs by smoking it. When taken orally, the effects of the drugs are lessened uh, compared with the effects when given uh, parenterally. When heroin passes through the liver, it's, it's metabolized into acetylmorphine, uh, which continues to exert narcotic effects that may outlast the effects of naloxone, uh, which is a narcotic antagonist that we all know about. So morphine is commonly used, is a commonly used analgesic in the pre-hospital setting, and it's a potent vasodilator. When given to young adults, it usually metabolizes in two to three hours. It takes adults longer to metabolize um, morphine. Morphine and heroin can can produce an impressive dreamlike state. Uh, shortly after injection, the user will appear to pass out despite being quite lucid. So the, the classic presentation of opioid use features euphoria, uh, hypotension, respiratory depression, pinpoint pupils, pinpoint pupils, uh, vomiting may or may not be present, coma, seizures, uh, secondary to hypoxia, cardiac arrest, secondary to respiratory arrest. Allergic phenomena may rarely occur with opioid use as well. With increased doses, coma seizures, uh, coma or seizures, usually secondary to hypoxia and cardiac arrest, usually secondary to respiratory arrest are common. Those are quite common. So you're gonna have to provide that support. So let's talk a little bit about Narcan or naloxone. It's an antidote that reverses the effects of opioid or opioid overdose. 
Uh, the medication, it can be administered via an IV line, uh, intramuscularly, uh, or IM, or intranasally, like through an atomizer. Oh, sorry. My bad. Can you see it now? Don't lie. Okay. All right. So, anyway. So rudely interrupted by logic. Uh, so you're going to give that, you can give that intranasal route as becoming preferred route, uh, the alternative route for administering naloxone, but it's the preferred route. Um, you give it through a, a syringe and an atomizer. A lot of times uh, you can give it other ways, but a lot of times we use an atomizer. Uh, does anybody know what an atomizer or not know what an atomizer is? That, you don't have to be rude. That's just rude. Uh, <clears throat> look like Chris Foster. I'm not a redhead. Uh, the dosage of Narcan is going to be 0 0.4 to 2 milligrams. 2 milligrams. Oh, Ty already knows he ain't going to pass this class. He's just here for entertainment value at this point. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I saw Zach Barrett. Uh, I see Zach, Zach Barrett quite often on Facebook. He's always doing something. He's got a glorious mustache. If I could grow a mustache like that, I wouldn't mind so much. Uh, some EMS systems allow AEMTs to administer Narcan uh, by the intranasal route. <laughs> And then uh, the antidote is atomized through the nares into the nasal mucosa. You want to do it, in, usually you want to half and half, do it half and half wise. If you are going to do it that way, uh, it may precipitate withdrawal symptoms resulting in violent behavior or seizure activity. So you don't you don't necessarily, I saw him at a baseball game the other day. Sorry, that was a little random for the rest of you. I just saw it over there. Um, some of, that's why we talk about when you do these things, you don't want to give the max amount right away. Uh, you may be creating your own problems if you just load somebody down with Narcan. Also, if you look at it this way, uh, in some instances, an unresponsive patient uh, that's breathing is a cooperative patient. So maybe you don't want to bring him all the way out. You know, you or him or her all the way out of it. You just want to give enough to be able to get your, your symptoms of life uh, back in order, right? If you bring them all the way out of it, you may induce vomiting, which can induce um, aspiration of vomitus. Uh, you could create your own problems. You could create uh, psychological problems for a patient such as that uh, and yourself um, for bringing that patient back really quick. One thing, one smart, one smart ass move that paramedics uh, used to do all the time is they would wait till they got to the hospital and then load the patient down with Narcan. And then when the patient ended up in the hospital, this patient would be really mad at them or throw up all over the hospital, which is a terrible way to build rapport with your uh, ER. 
So acute narcotic reversal may lead to vomiting and aspiration of that, um, like I was saying. Uh, this medication should only be used when the patient has agonal respirations or apnea, right? So you're going to place an oropharyngeal or a nasopharyngeal airway and ventilate the, ventilate the patient using a bag valve mask prior to administering uh, naloxone. So provide adequate ventilation while administering the Narcan to decrease the risk of permanent brain damage related to hypoxia. <clears throat> so if the patient does not respond to Narcan, it's possible that the person could have a mixed bag overdose, okay? Uh, which means the patient may have taken multiple drugs, some of which are not opioids and will not respond to Narcan. Uh, the person has a head injury, that can be an, an issue. Narcan can't fix that, right? Uh, in such, a, in such a scenario, insert an advanced airway, provide other care as needed, and transport the patient to the appropriate facility from there. Um, it is important to remember that the patient may have other underlying illnesses also, including uh, hepatitis, uh, HIV, AIDS, malnutrition, things like that. So medications taken for any of these conditions may interact with the opioids creating a myriad of, of uh, symptoms for that patient. Older patients may take multiple medications for pain also. They do that on purpose because they got, they got Narcan that's about to expire. <laughs> so in, in any, in any uh, result of this, you're going to monitor that patient close and provide prompt transport to the closest appropriate facility. Um, now, when you're completing your patient care report, your PCR, be sure to document whether ingestion was intentional or accidental, how much was taken and when it was taken. Document whether the patient uh, has vomited since ingestion of whatever drug that was taken. Take any pills or bottles to the hospital with the patient. Report findings to uh, receiving personnel of any illicit substances to law enforcement and any illicit substances. Don't take the Coke with you if you suspect that or the meth or whatever. Don't take it with <laughs> it's just not good practice to carry illicit drugs in your ambulance. All right, let's talk about stimulants. So few drugs compare to stimulants in their, in their abuse potential. So particularly things like uh, cocaine, amphetamines, or methamphetamines. Uh, First-time users can become addictive within a, few, within a few days, very quick hook. Uh, once addicted, quitting is extremely difficult and highly unlikely for that patient. So these stimulants, they can be taken orally. Uh, they can be smoked or they can be given via IV injection. So some of the clinical presentation of this, uh, as you can see here in the slide, are going to be like your excitement, uh, delirium, excited delirium, um, tachycardia, hyper or hypotension with a fast pulse, dilated pupils. So stimulants, dilated pupils. Makes sense, right? Dilated, the stimulant, you know, get it? As a... Uh, as toxic levels are reached, the patient may experience at, at that point uh, psychosis, um, hyperpyroxemia, uh, which would be like heat, you know, the burning up, tremor, seizures, cardiac arrest can occur. Um, so getting into the stimulants, 
we'll talk about cocaine or we'll talk about cocaine. It's a naturally occurring alkaloid uh, that is extracted from the, the uh, atroxylon cocoa, co coca plant, uh, the leaves of it, which is in South America. Uh, once it's processed into cocaine hydrochloride, the active ingredient in the leaves is 100% pure, dramatically increasing the toxic potential. It's sold under many other types of street names, uh, things like blow, flake, lady, nose candy, snow, toot, 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 right? I don't know if anybody ever watched that video. Might do a little bit of toot toot. All right, so uh, it's had devastating effects in the U.S. population. White lion, yeah, white lion. There's a whole bunch of them. <clears throat> Cocaine is a local anesthetic and a uh, central nervous system stimulant. It also creates euphoria that features uh, enhanced alertness, right? One of the most uh, psychologically addictive drugs available. Cocaine is quickly absorbed across all mucosal membranes. It can, uh, it can be applied topically. It can be swallowed. It can be snorted. It can be injected uh, intravenously. It, it may be mixed with uh, two inexpensive ingredients, uh, baking soda and water. Once it's mixed together into a paste like slurry and cooked or baked, the end result is a smokable cocaine, which we call what? Yes, it will. Call it crack. If you, if you make this paste, and then it'll be crack. So when cocaine snorted nasally, the effects are felt within one or two minutes, and then the peak effects occur within 20 to 30 minutes. When cocaine is smoked, the onset of effects is more rapid, um, about eight to 10 seconds when it's smoked. And the high is more intense and uh, the effects, they're not gonna last as long though. So when the effects of the cocaine wears off, the user experiences what's called a crash. Uh, it's usually characterized by depression, irritability, sleeplessness, and exhaustion. Uh, depending on the amount and length of cocaine use, the, the person may experience a cascade of adverse effects, uh, collectively referred to as a cocaine washout syndrome. So this syndrome, it presents as, as hypoactive state related to a lack of uh, synaptic neurotransmitters. So to avoid the crash, uh, the user will seek more cocaine and sedatives in order to avoid it. So because of this, someone addicted to cocaine may also be addicted to other types of drugs as well. So amphetamines. Uh, amphetamines are structurally similar to the derivatives of, uh, what is that, uh, phenylethylamine. So this includes things like uh, methamphetamine, which is going to be like ice or crank. Uh, you also have what's called, I'm not even going to try to, um, so I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I, actually, I will. Uh, methylene. Methylene dioxyamphetamine, which is MDA. Now that's pretty good. Or also called Atom. And then you also have uh, methylene dioxy methamphetamine, which is MDMA, uh, or it's called Eve, or what we most mostly call it uh, ecstasy. Okay. So amphetamine. And amphetamine-like 
drugs have a number of legitimate clinical applications as well. Yep, Molly being one of them. Um, nasal decongestants, got amphetamines in there, some diet pills, drugs for narcolepsy, uh, drugs for attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. All right, so then we'll go into methamphetamines. <laughs> so problematic, it's problematic because it's low cost, um, long acting up to 12 hours and extremely addictive. So ingredients to cook methamphetamine are available locally uh, within the United States and the drug is easily and quickly made. Uh, it's the manufacturer of, uh, its manufacturer avoids the hassle, risk, and high cost associated with importing cocaine, right? And then uh, meth labs should be treated as hazardous materials and ingredients. Um, in the next slide, Shaw, I'll show you exactly what, it, what you purchase and how to make meth. Well, let me look. I'm kidding. I'm not going to. All right, so synthetic cathinones uh, marketed as bath salts. We talked about, we, we started hitting on that a little earlier, right? And so under unique names such as Blaze is what it's also can be called, uh, have become public health problems lately. So these stimulants contain an active ingredient uh, that's, that is a, a pseudoephedrine or pseudofed reduction drug called uh, methaconine or methacolinone. I'm sorry, methacathinone or a similar uh, methamphetamine knockoff from there. <clears throat> Users typically snort, smoke, or ingest those drugs, these type of drugs. Uh, these drugs couple with uh, intensity and long-lasting effects of the metham uh, methamphetamine with the euphoric effects of crack cocaine. The more serious side effects of these designer drugs uh, include agitation, hallucinations, and paranoia. So some signs and symptoms of stimulant abuse are going to be wide-eyed, thin as a rail appearance, you got uh, nervous or jittery movements, week-long runs without sleep, and are, are not uncommon for serious users. Uh, patients often go without eating. As days pass, the uh, increasing paranoia sets in, and patients are usually amped up when they encounter them, and it often takes <laughs> very little to set off a, a violent tirade at that point. So cocaine may cause a variety of serious or potential uh, fatal complications. So some things be like uh, the lethal electrocardiograph arrhythmias, jack up the heart, right? Acute myocardial infarction, seizures, stroke, apnea, uh, hyperthermia, hyperthermia. Also uh, crack smokers may risk pneumothorax, and uh, uh, what you something you would call a uh, muonum medestinium or pneumonia? What's like a pneumonia in the mediastinum? So some other stuff that you may you may get from this are like a uh, some cl or some clinical presentation for some of these patients that are abusing the amphetamines or methamphetamines is almost identical to a patient that's abusing cocaine, except that the effects last hours longer. Uh, the, use, the use of synthetic cathinones is associated with significant paranoia, 
Um, we'll see you, Liam. Uh, hallucinations, incredible strength, uh, excited delirium, and other bizarre behaviors. Uh, some other stuff that you'll see is like tachycardia, diaphoresis, nausea, and uh, hyperthermia may also be present. Seven six two three, if you want the code. We're not far from being done anyway. So some treatment for stimulants are going to be things like uh, you're going to maintain the maximum oxygen saturation levels. Uh, give that oxygen, right? You want to prevent seizures with adequate sedation. Um, monitor serial vital signs. Uh, consider paramedic backup for advanced airway if it's needed. Uh, give that vas get that Vascular access, establish the access, apply the pulse ox, and then if the patient is having a seizure, you want to make sure that you protect their airway. Um, transport the patient to the appropriate facility. Uh, in severe cases of stimulant overdose, the patient may present with uh, hyperthermia, which can be lethal, can burn up. So you may have to apply like ice packs or misting the patient's skin to reduce temperature. Turning on the AC in the ambo lamp. So regular assessments to breath sounds are going to avoid uh, inadvertent high oh, oh, inadvertent overhydration if necessary. Uh, remember the potential for the patient to be emotionally or psychologically unstable. So watch your own back. Contact law enforcement, most definitely, if you suspect the possibility of violence that can occur. All right, so up next, we're talking about marijuana and cannabis compounds. So it's harvested and dried leaves and flower buds of the, can uh, the cannabis sativa plant also known as weed, pie, dope, smoke, and a bunch of other names, sticky icky, all that stuff. Uh, it's usually smoked, but it can be ingested, uh, such as when it's baked with uh, baked goods or scored, stored goods. Uh, the onset of effects is in minutes when, when smoking. Oral ingestion, ingestion is going to slow the onset uh, to several hours, quite possibly. Users have a distorted sense of time and space and uh, a, feel, a feeling of unreality. Smoking marijuana results in bronchodilation and a uh, slight tachycardia. Some other signs and symptoms may include euphoria, drowsiness, uh, decreased short-term memory, diminished motor coordination, increased appetite, um, and then uh, also uh, the telltale, the telltale bloodshot eyes. So your management is going to be supportive care in this. There's a low likelihood of serious medical complication unless they're coughing a whole lot. <laughs> uh, a novice user may exhibit some behavioral symptoms such as paranoia and rarely psychosis. Uh, just reassurance with both paranoia and psychosis may be able to help. You get into other things too, like spice. So spice is going to be a mixture of dried plant material that's sold as incense 
in efforts to avoid uh, existing drug laws. So it's a psychoactive drug. The blend of synthetic uh, cannabinoids or knockoffs of the naturally occurring psychoactive elements in marijuana. The active substance is sprayed onto a plant-like material for smoking or sold as a liquid for vaporizing e-cigarettes. Some adverse effects include psychosis, hallucinations, tachycardia, vomiting, renal problems, uh, and seizures. I've seen some crazy stuff off of this, and it usually depends on what batch. I mean, we'll, you'll know if it's a bad batch or a good batch, um, you know, what, of how crazy your week's going to be. Because a batch will come in, it won't be good, and you'll get it because it constantly changes. The chemical makeup of, of it constantly changes. And that's how they can avoid some of these uh, regulations. So fluids and airway maintenance is going to be the most appropriate. Uh, benzodiazepines are going to be recommended medication for patients experiencing a seizure for this. There's not a lot you can do. You can't Narcan them or anything like that. It doesn't work. Um, it's just a supportive, a supportive care state is what you're going to use. But some of these people will get just excited delirium, and it's, it gets pretty crazy. All right, so hallucinogens. So hallucinogens are gonna alter a person's uh, sensory perception. Uh, seeing, hearing, feeling things that aren't actually present are gonna be some of, that, uh, some of those effects. Yeah. And uh, experiences involving hallucinogens are very markedly across the board. Uh, even among people taking the same dose of the same drug from the same batch, uh, you can have different effects across the board. So the classic, the classic, the classic hallucinogen is going to be uh, lysergic or lysergic acid diethiamide, which is LSD, LSD. So LSD primarily affects the senses rather than changing uh, physiologic functions. So synthesis, uh, synthesis is crossing of the senses can occur. With, with higher doses, the, effect of, the effects of LSD can last longer than 12 hours. Uh, although three or four hours is more typical. Some of the effects of L the LSD is going to be your tachycardia, um, mild hypertension, dilated pupils, and a bad trip can be frightening because, uh, because it can cause acute anxiety attacks. So some other things that you can have is when we talk about shrooms or mushrooms, <clears throat> probably the most uh, probably the most frequently used hallucinogens in the uh, United States after LSD. The onset of symptoms and hallucinogenic effects are similar to LSG or uh, LSG uh, LSD, but less intense. Uh, is within 30 minutes of ingestion and affects uh, usually after 46 or four to six hours. Some, some signs and symptoms are going to include nausea, vomiting, uh, mydriasis, mild tachycardia, and some mild hypertension. The likelihood of any serious medical side effect is low, uh, though seizures and hyperthermia might occur. Uh, what you want to be careful of with this is, is if they got incorrect, you know, if they pick and start chewing on or eating on or cooking up uh, the wrong type of shrooms. And at that point, you're looking at uh, some toxic effects um, or poison. So some other stuff out there is going to be like your PCP or angel dust. It's relatively uncommon among young adults. <clears throat> PCP is typically smoked or snorted, although it can be injected also. 
Uh, some other some things you'll see with it is uh, slurred speech, staggered gait, tachycardia, hypertension, uh, staring blankly for extended periods, and um, you'll have some. Sometimes you'll have an involuntary or rhythmic movement of the eyes. It's that's common with PCP use. Muscle rigidity and especially grinding of the teeth. Uh, prompt many users to resort to pacifiers in an effort to avoid pronounced jaw uh, jaw aches. You may have seen that like uh, in photos or videos of rave clubs, uh, rave clubs or raves, pacifiers. So users, users are also going to have a high tolerance for pain and can also exhibit, exhibit almost a uh, superhuman strength because they're using everything they got. All right, up next is uh, ketamine, which is a awesome, awesomely helpful drug. Um, yeah, for paramedics. Yeah, it works out very well. It's, we used it in the battlefield, and using it in the battlefield is it had fantastic effects. Um, but illegally, uh, it's similar in structure to PCP, similar. Most ketamine available on the street is stolen from veterinary clinics, uh, although this drug is increasingly used in emergency medicine as well. Uh, ketamine is a is a popular club drug, and it's frequently used in combination with other club drugs like alcohol and other types of stimulants. Uh, ketamine is colorless and odorless, and is commonly found in powdered form. <clears throat> it's often mixed in a drink, although it can it can be snorted as well. Uh, it's a dissociative anesthetic. Think about dissociative. You can disassociate with the pain, and and it's that you you still the pain is still there. You just don't care, kind of deal. The pain is still there. You just don't care about it as much. So users are going to present with a mild inebriation, a dreamy, or a, they may have erotic thoughts and uh, increased sociability sociability, so social butterflies. Um, at higher doses, a patient may have pronounced nausea, uh, difficulty moving, and a complaint of entering into another reality, okay? In extreme cases, uh, users will enter what's called the K-hole, uh, which involves like an outer body, out of body experience. Uh, Long-term use can result in extensive problems with memory, cognitive impairment, uh, or the inability to properly speak or see. Yeah, exhaustion can do that too. Yep, that's right. All right, something else is uh, mescaline, which is going to be the, the dried flower buttons of the peyote cactus. It's a hallucinogen. No currently accepted medical use in the United States at all. Profound vomiting occurs shortly after their ingestion. Uh, the psychedelic experience then typically begins with feelings of increased sensitivity to sensory stimulations. Uh, users may experience hallucinations, a distortion of time and space and out-of-body experiences. Um, the, the physical effects of mescaline are similar to LSD, uh, including dilated pupils, increased heart rate, and mild hypertension, and increased body temperature. I know these are so boring.
I'm gonna skip over some of these. I say we've lost most. Huh. And you see here for uh, sedatives and hypnotics. So high concentration of oxygen uh, for shock, you're going to do a rapid infusion of one to two liter bolus, boluses of normal saline. So cardiac medications. So some of the major classes of uh, cardiac medications uh, are gonna be your antidysrhythmics, your beta blockers, your cal calcium channel blockers, and your cardiac glycosides. Uh, angiotensin converting enzymes, uh, enzyme inhibitors. I know we talked about that too before. And some, many patients take a combination of these and uh, sometimes three or more of these. And uh, overdose of these medications is usually accidental. You know, grandma and grandpa took more than what they were supposed to or took both their morning and evening dose. <clears throat> There's your signs and symptoms. So your heart rhythm disturbances, most commonly that's going to be uh, bradycardia or a heart, um, some sort of heart block. So the best thing to do is you want to ensure that you have a patent airway, you have adequate ventilation, uh, you're going to administer high flow oxygen to those patients. Establish that vascular access. Um, so interventions and antidotes are available if the specific agent is identified. So you want to make sure you have that vascular access so it can be given as quickly as possible. Uh, if there's, if you have cases of hypotension, you want to be able to like sequential fluid boluses of normal saline. So you can bring that uh, blood pressure into an acceptable range. So because of the sophistication of some cardiac drugs and the likelihood that the patient may be taking multiple medications, contacting med control to consult with a physician is going to be prudent. Make sure you know. So there's some other drugs, um, other medications like um, erectile dysfunction medications are the most dangerous of the various drugs that can increase sexual gratification. So these drugs are going to be like your uh, sildenafil or Viagra or uh, Tadalafil, your Cialis or Vardenafil, um, which is going to be like Levitra. All of them are of fills, of fills, of fills, right? And they're contraindicated for patients who take nitrates uh, for cardiac conditions. Sometimes they still get them though. So a lot of times what they call is a severe hypertension and then a, a total cardiovascular collapse. Yeah. If the car, if if cardiac arrest does occur, just uh, go with your local your normal protocols. Um, be sure to ask. You know, be sure to ask if that's something that they took. 
So patients taking a variety of psychiatric medications may experience uh, toxic toxicologic uh, emergencies as well. So TCAs or tricyclic antidepressants, uh, TCAs carries a, a high risk of intentional overdose. So some common signs and symptoms of TCA overdose are going to be your AMS or altered mental status, uh, dysrhythmias, dry mouth, blurred vision or dilated pupils, uh, urinary retention, constipation, pulmonary edema. Uh, <coughs> with more serious toxic exposure, you got to be alert for ventricular tachycardia, uh, hypotension, uh, respiratory depression, and seizures. So managing patients with TCA overdose is going to include some of the, your normal measures. Uh, you got to maintain the airway, call for a paramedic, high flow oxygen, establish that vascular access. Can I help you? Huh? What are you doing? It's cold. That you were doing something. All right, go. Thanks. Kid, I'm saying I need to turn the air down. Yeah, turn the air down. I don't care. Up, oh, you mean up. Lord of mercy, kid. Putting his hand on ice water or something. So and he's trying to tell me the house is too cold. So you gotta one of one of the things is uh, you gotta assess the blood glucose uh, levels, and then first time you ever heard what uh, turn the air up? Yeah. So because uh, what we did is we you know I was a, I was afraid that the power would go out. I got a generator and everything, but to, to save a little bit of energy on it, if I just freeze the house out and then if the power goes out, then it's going to be, you know, I'll be good to go for a while before I have to worry about running everything up. <clears throat> but uh, here it is. We're in the good and they still have it freezing or I, or I still have it freezing in this house. So everybody's wearing coats. <laughs> exercise the AC every now and then. Uh, also, you got to rule out head trauma as being, because that could be a possible cause of your AMS. So some other things are going to be like your... Uh, your monoamine oxidase inhibitors or MAOIs, uh, sometimes used to treat depression. So this can uh, precipitate a, hyper, uh, a hypertensive crisis if it's taken in conjunction with some uh, tyramine-containing foods. So the symptoms can be delayed uh, six to 12 hours, and even as long as 24 hours later, the symptoms can come about. So some early signs and symptoms are going to be like hyperactivity or dysrhythmias, uh, usually uh, sinus tachycardia. Hyperventilation uh, can be one of them also. With increased levels of toxicity, though, um, <clears throat> You got to be alert for chest pain, palpitations, uh, diaphoreses. No antidote is available. Uh, don't give syrup of Epicac. Uh, make sure that you establish that those lines, right? Those IVs. And if you need to for hypotension, give sequential fluid boluses of normal saline. So you can see a common for all this. There may not be a lot that we can do, but we can do our 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 normal workups. So work with your patient, work with the symptoms, treat the symptoms or the signs and symptoms that you have, and you should be able to combat whatever's going on to get to the hospital. What this, what learning this does is, is it, it shows you what to look out for and what's going to help enhance your assessment 
and also your pass off at the higher echelon of care so they can do something about it. So SSRIs there, same thing. Lithium. It's a big cornerstone drug for treating bipolar disorders. So same thing there for the treatment, right? NSAIDs. So a lot of times GI bleeding can be caused by taking so much of it, long-term use of it. Or So supportive care for those patients. Salicylates. So some of your OTC products containing salicylates cause toxicity, right? Is your chief complaints there? Are gonna be like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain? Uh, diaphoreses, uh, ringing in the ears would be one of them, some pulmonary edema, acid-based balance disturbances. So you may experience or see um, me metabolic acidosis or combined respiratory alkalosis metabolic acidosis in case of severe toxicity of it. There's no antidote or antagonist that's available. So again, you're gonna have a uh, supportive. So acetaminophen is a well-tolerated drug with few side effects. It's important to try to accurately estimate the time of its ingestion. Uh, this information is going to drive the decision-making process for patient care. Also, there is, there is an antidote for acetaminophen toxicity. It exists, which should be given less than eight hours after the ingestion. So some pre-hospital management are the, the normals, right? Establish, maintain an airway. IVs, um, activated charcoal could be could be administered possibly. Uh, you just need to consult with your uh, med control. So gamma hydroxybutyrate or GHB. So this is a frequently associated with sexual assaults. It's available as a odorless, colorless, and odorless and colorless liquid. Uh, it's got a salty taste to it, but it may not be noted when it's placed in a drink. <clears throat> it produces or it's, it produces a pronounced hypnotic effect uh, along with disinhibition and severe passivity and uh, antigrade amnesia. That. So you forget what happened or you forget the experience. So some of the treatments gonna focus on, on CNS depression and the risk associated with the patient being unable to protect their, unway, uh, their airway. <clears throat> so as, as with that, you're gonna maintain your ABCs, right? Monitor that LOC, um, vascular access, apply a pulse ox, and rapid transport. Organophosphates uh, is a major 
is a major component in insecticides like orthene, uh, di diazinon, um, malathion, or malathion, malathion, I think it's called. Uh, mostly agricultural or in the home, bug, bug junk, right? So similar performing compounds are used as nerve gases uh, that are designed for chemical warfare. Organophosphates and nerve gases are classified as cholinergic agents. So these agents are going to overstimulate the body's functions, controlled by parasympathetic uh, uh, nerves. It's going to result in heavy salivation, um, mucus secretion, urination, crying, and abnormal heart rate. Uh, you're you yourself are unlikely to encounter nerve gas. Um, you may be called to care for patients that have been exposed to organophosphates or insecticides, more likely pesticides, uh, or certain wild mushrooms also. Suicide attempts account for a considerable share of organophosphate poisonings for that. When suicide's the goal, the poison is usually taken by mouth. Accidental agricultural exposure is another common source. And in that case, remember removal of that patient's clothing. Don't pull their shirts over their head, cut it all off uh, because it's on their skin. It's on, it's on whatever they were wearing. So just touching it or ha you could end up getting ill or they could get re-ill uh, re or re-sick. You know, re um, they could have a reintroduction of issues because it's still on their clothing. So uh, in any case, for organophosphates or nerve agents, you're going to use a mnemonic called sludgem, sludgem, uh, or, or uh, dumbbells. So sludgem is going to be helpful in your assessment because you're looking for recontaminated. Yeah, that's, that's it. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, sludgem, so salivation or sweating, uh, lacrimation, which is tearing in the eyes, uh, urination, defecation, emesis, uh, muscle twitches or meiosis, like pinpoint pupils. And then you also have dumbbells, which is diarrhea, urination, meiosis, which is constriction of the pupils, and muscle weakness, uh, bradycardia, bronchospasm, or bronchorrhea which is discharge of mucus from the lungs, uh, emesis, lacrimation, seizures, salivation, or sweating. So as before, we talked about the contaminated clothing. Um, also, same care, right? ABCs, high flow oxygen, IV access, call for backup, pulse ox, transport immediately. Nothing new there. Now, in the military, we developed antidotes to the nerve gas uh, that can be administered if they're available and indicated for that. So the most common antidote is called a, du a, a duodote kit, and the antidote treatment nerve agent uh, auto-injector, which is called the ATNA and the Mark I kit. So <laughs> I actually found my kits. I think I told you all that. found my kits a while back as I was cleaning out my garage. I found some of my kits live, live kits. Uh, expired, but still cause issues. So carbon monoxide, we have beat this one with a dead, like a, we beat this one like a dead horse. Yeah. We beat it down. So I'm not going to get too far into it. So call the, uh, call the fire department to get any type of devices that you may need. 
like a CO, C, uh, CO monitoring devices or anything like that. Yep, good stuff. So a lot of times um, in EMT and everything else, I talked about cherry red color of the skin. That's a very that's a very late sign of uh, CO poisoning. So a lot of times we talked about that they need uh yeah that's correct. So a lot of times, or what I talked about earlier, high flow oxygen, hyperbaric chamber, you need to know what facilities have them. Um, so this is what is important uh, to know as well. And this, this could help save, this could help save you a lot of, or it could save a lot of heartache on scenes of uh, various events that first responders are at. So a lot of times your fire department, you know, we ask for medical, um, for medical to be there, for an ambulance to be there, uh, for standby. So this is this is what they're looking for you to possibly diagnose and and help. Uh, well, that's that's just for the lungs. That's just for the lungs. CO poisoning can happen. It's it can be diffused throughout the body. Will it help if you're perfusing? If you're perfusing into that oxygen, yes. Will Will it help? Thing is, is the patient going to tolerate that? Um, you know, there to maintain an airway, they should be able to tolerate it better. But mainly, you just you got to get that high flow oxygen in there. That's the main thing. But a, a big one that we talked about for what I was getting to with firefighters is that that's kind of the things that we're trying to we're trying to look at or we're we're wanting you to be able to diagnose and treat is CO poisoning because of that fire or cyanide poisoning because of that fire. And there is there are cyanide poisoning antidotes as well. Uh, not a lot of services have them or keep them readily available. Uh, I think it's important. What I, what I do think is that the fire departments themselves, um, if you, they have the ability to, to keep those available, or the chiefs, even the, the who's going to be the incident commanders, to have those type of drugs available. And that way, if something does happen, they can go up to the ambulance or whomever and say, hey, here's, here's our cyanide poisoning kit. And boom, be able to help that uh, patient out. There's some there's some stuff with metals. Chlorine gas, pretty big one. So like in the house, in the home, most likely. So industrial settings, we get that. We get how you can end up with a uh, chlorine gas exposure. In the house, it's whenever you mix bleach with other types of cleaning products. Uh, that's when you might have an issue. <coughs> no. Yeah. No, we don't keep IV bags in a cooler anymore. 
we do fire standbys. But the thing, the problem with IV bags and coolers is that you know you don't want to force hyperthermia or hypo hypothermia onto somebody either. It will rapidly cool somebody down. Don't get me wrong, but you will definitely you stand a chance of them uh, bageling down. Yeah, Lord of mercy. Cyanide, and there, and so you're looking at cyanide here. Uh, the cyanide, uh, also the the CO and all that. There's there's special detectors, and some of these detectors that we buy, like our our five gases or six gases or what have you. You have to buy the you have to buy the the correct sensor for those gases, or you have to buy the correct gas. Not all of them detect what they're looking for, um, so the fire department has to have the correct sensor, and they need to be using it during uh, during fire operations, all fire operations. Um, fire departments, especially around here, have a bad habit of not monitoring. Uh, after the fire, they'll put the fire out. It'll still be smoking, but they they won't continuously monitor. They'll just say, "Oh, it's not actively on fire." Strip off their mask and their SCBAs and go in and do overhaul. And uh, you should be monitoring uh, at that point in time and looking for those types of gases uh, in the fire themselves. So a lot of because a lot of times that smoke inhalation happens during that salvage and overhaul phase. Oh, that's no bueno. Try to kill you. So a lot of times, depending on, so here we're talking about uh, some mis miscellaneous services or so like uh, your different alcohols miscellaneous uh, substances. So talking about your different types of alcohol poisonings. So funny enough, uh, you may go to the hospital and they administer more alcohol to you, but a different type of alcohol. Um, you can actually get a prescription for a beer in a hospital. It's probably way more expensive than what you're used to buying. <laughs> But there are prescriptions for beer in a hospital for certain types of uh, alcohol poisonings, such as these types of alcohol poisonings. So food poisoning. So Think food poisoning with two or more people being sick at the same time, at the same scene, uh, or kind of like carbon monoxide poisoning. Almost half of food poisonings occur in restaurants, cafeterias, and delicatessens. Um, three toxins produce 35% of food-related deaths. So salmonella, listeria, and toxoplasma. So... Uh, <laughs> So, you know, you may have saw, you may have seen in the news where a, a listeria, actually it wasn't in the news that, that well. So we had a fire rescue international a couple years back and one of the hotels that was being used for fire rescue international, it's a huge conference, like the biggest fire conference in the world. And uh, so one of the hotels that we were going to had an outbreak of listeria. So everybody's Everybody had to be moved to another hotel. It was absolutely ridiculous. But I want to say it was like uh, they had 12, uh, 12 patients. Some other stuff with food poisoning.
So poisonous plants. So most plant-related exposures involve children under the age of six. Um, death from plant ingestions are rare. Your book, Table 1220 or Table 23-5. Has a, has a text list of common toxic plants. It's impossible to lift them all. So Diphenbachia, <clears throat> it's a green plant with broad leaves. Um, it's nicknamed dumb cane <laughs> because eating Diphenbachia uh, or dif uh, Diphenbachia can result in a person being unable to speak. In some severe instances, you can have edema in the tongue and larynx, which can lead to an airway compromise, right? Um, so, castor bean seeds, castor beans. It's, uh, it originate from an attractive shrub, but are that are highly poisonous. So a lot of times, if you have issues with spiders at your house, uh, people will tell you to plant castor beans around your house. So castor beans, uh, just chewing on a few of the seeds, it can kill a child, or make you very sick, or even kill you. Uh, so castor beans or ricin can be, or the beans can actually make up what's called ricin, okay? If you ever looked at, if you ever looked that up, R-I-C-I-N. So if anything, you wanna find out exactly what was eaten or what was ingested or what happened uh, with that plant. And you just need to make sure that uh, you call a poison control center when that happens or that you get a hold of your, uh, your hospital because they may actually want you to bring in a piece of the plant or the plant itself or what have you. So there's some pictures of some poisonous plants. So A, is uh, your uh, Diphenbachia. B, we talked about that er earlier, mistletoe. C, castor beans. D, nightshade. E, foxglove. F, it's going to be a rhododendron. 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 Something like that. G is gypsum weed. And H is death camas. It's crazy sounding. Death camas. All right, there's some more poisonous plants. So I is going to be your poison ivy. J is your poison oak. Leaves of leaves of three, let them be. K is pokeweed. Or pokeweed. We see that all the time. Because you smash it on somebody's clothes. <laughs> it leaves a stain. You got rosary pea and then poison sumac right there. All right. That is the end of that. All right, so I do have a, uh, 
I do have a quiz out for, for this one. Um, it's not going to be due. The quiz is not going to be due until Sunday. So I'm going to make it due Sunday. And I, I'm going to open it up for, uh, for some of our people that are, that are, you know, displaced right now. Or So I'm going to open it up a little bit, um, give an extended amount of time to do it. And then also because of the stresses and everything else, I got it to where you can take it, uh, you can take it a, a multiple time for that. All right. Uh, also, I'm going to extend the time for the um, for the discussion question. Please ensure that you do the discussion question. I will read all of them this week or the ones that come in. Um, so let's make sure we're doing that. Um, also, yeah, also, uh, let's look on there, uh, you know, look on there and your tests and everything. Make sure you're studying your past test because it won't be long and we'll be having the, the module quiz come up. So make sure we're taking a look at that, the module quizzes. Okay. So uh, let's make sure we're taking a look at that. And uh, does anybody have any questions before we close out for the night? Oh, yeah. OK, if nobody has any questions here, uh, remember that you can contact me. Uh, uh, usually through, usually if you do, if you contact me for a long passage, definitely do it through uh, Navigate because then, like I've said a bunch of times, you'll get, it'll hit me on Navigate and it will hit me in my email. So in two. Yeah. And then um, also, also if you want to reach me sh short message wise, you can reach me on Discord. It's uh, pretty easy to reach me. Okay. Get pretty responsive on there. All right. Other than that, does anybody have any questions or anything for me? Okay. So the... Whoops. Yep, there we go. So the code for tonight is going to be 7623. Oh, was it? Yeah, the code was 5436. But for the last one, but this code is 7623. 7623. Okay. Uh, if nobody has anything else for me, then I'm going to jump off here. Uh, I'll exit out. <clears throat> Go ahead and stop recording now.